Okay, welcome. Glad to see everybody. Sounds like there's a lot of energy, a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm. How are the projects going? How's your project group? Okay. Did you take the feedback from the peer review and the feedback from the teacher review and revise your design a little bit, revise your uh, pseudocode, fix your algorithms, think about efficiency, think about implementability, and then begin to move into implementation with MIPS? I hope you're doing that. I hope you're not jumping straight from uh, your first preliminary design into implementation. The idea of the feedback phase is to correct your design, to improve it, to make it uh, clearer, and also to understand about what's needed for good implementation, including headers for software modules and line comments so that it's extremely clear to someone else who reads it. Just because you understand it doesn't mean you're expressing it clearly to someone else. So the purpose of a document like a design report is to make clear and if the teachers didn't understand, they gave feedback. If the peer reviewing group didn't understand, they gave feedback. They said, huh, Bune, what are you trying to do? You're not expressing it in a way that can be understood by others. You know something? The smartest engineer in the world that has the greatest ideas, who cannot clearly communicate them to someone else, is pretty useless because they're just stuck in his head. You must be able to express. That's why Bill Kent put such a strong emphasis on communication skills, verbal and written. So you must be able to express. That's why at the end of this uh, project, we're going to have an oral exam. You're going to come to us, and we're going to ask you Sozel questions. You're going to have to answer and defend your work and explain your work verbally. Engineers need to be able to stand up and communicate. They need also to be able to write clearly and, and express. Sometimes it's technical things. Sometimes it's non-technical things. But your communication skills will be stronger as you practice them, as you accept feedback, as you say, huh, he's right, that should have been better. Or maybe you learned from reviewing someone else's report. You saw great things there that you didn't do on your own report. It's possible that the feedback you got wasn't as valuable as the feedback you gained when you reviewed somebody else. I'm not sure. But all I know is you have three inputs now. You have some other group that reviewed your report. You have a teaching member of the teaching team that reviewed your report. And you reviewed a third report. So actually, there's now three sets of impacts, in, in, inputs which can help your team. Uh, the idea is that right now you're consolidating those feedbacks and improving your design before you move on to implementation. A big temptation in engineering is jump right to implementation before the design itself is sound and solid. Okay? Now, in my reviewing, I use big O notation a lot because I saw a lot of people who could have done the routine with one pass through the linked list. If there's N members, then that would be big O N, right? N, N actions, one per. And instead, they made it, managed to make it 2N, 3N, N squared, all kinds of interesting things. For every member of the list, I'll process the whole list. Oh, that's a great algorithm, N squared, OK? I mean, don't you remember anything from CS 101, 102, 201, and 202 about algorithm efficiency? All of those algorithms can be solved in O N with Katsaya 1, OK? You know, not 2n, not 3n, n. One pass through the linked list, do something to each member of the list. When you're at the end, you're done. We don't need to push them all on the stack and then pop them all off again. What does that mean? 2n, right? n times pushing, n times popping. If you're stacking, you're, you're, you're minimum 2n because you've got to push it on, you've got to pop it back off. You're 2n if you're stacking. How about just traverse the linked list element by element, do what you have to do, switch pointers, change values, or whatever. Now, maybe with the possible exception of sorting. Okay? I don't claim that sorting can be done order n, obviously. You've done a lot of research about sorting algorithms. I'm sure you've looked at many different sorting algorithms. How come I didn't see those, those clever algorithms? Insertion sort, exchange sort, bubble sort, quick sort. How come we didn't see those in the sorting? Come on, people. Let's integrate together the things that we learn from different courses in order to form a strong engineering solution. See, each course only teaches you a piece of the picture. When you're able to integrate the pieces of the picture together, you get a wide perspective. And that makes a strong engineer to be able to provide good solutions. You're becoming an engineer in this course. I don't know if you realize it. But you have to integrate in what you already know from CS 101, 102, 201, 202, your math courses in CS 223 and 224. We're expecting that in every course that you take in this curriculum. You're using all the background tools that you have in your toolbox and adding to them some more and then applying it to the solutions of that particular subject area. Okay? 
Now we picked linked lists specifically because it's a data structure, it's got lots of interesting algorithms, and it sits in memory in a nonlinear way. It's not like an array, oh, here's the first element, here's the second element, here's the third element. Arrays are a piece of cake. They map into memory very nicely. Linked lists are more interesting because pointers go who knows where all over the place, okay? <laughs> so you need to be able to manage pointers. And I know how difficult pointer management is in a high-level language. Everybody says, oh, C, C plus, all those awful pointers, get me back to Java. <laughs> <laughs> Love Java. But no, no, no. C and C++ are widely used industrial languages. Everybody doesn't solve their problems in Java out in the big real world. So therefore, what have we done in this course? We've said, OK, let's make pointers a lot more practical. Let's get right down on the hardware level. Let's see, not pointer, let's see address. Yeah, they're the same thing. At the high level, they call it a pointer. At the low level, we call it an address. Let's work with addresses. So what I've done in this project is actually to help you to integrate data structures, algorithms, pointers, high level language, and low level language in memory and register, and pull it all together in a nice assembly language project. It's a really beautiful uh, uh, project actually it brings together a lot of different things and teamwork and communication skills and time management yeah there's a lot here there's a lot here so let's see what you do okay you got about a week and a half to go it's due the following Monday after not this weekend but the next weekend so just encouraging your teams to sp keep spending time together keep talking if anybody's cop mush from the group, I need to know about it. If there's anybody who's not actively participating, or they had an operation, or their grandmother died the third time, or whatever, you know, whatever their bahana <laughs> is, I, I want to know about it. Oh, listen, I had, I had a student, he lost three grandmothers in one semester. <laughs> oh, well, me. Most people I know only have two, and for both to die is pretty rare. He had three, because, yeah, oh, wish they, you know, the grandmother died, got to go to a funeral. Yeah, oh, really, me, really. All right, so whatever the Bahanas are, I need to know about them. If you, do, if you have a group member that's not fully participating, okay, because personal participation grade is real important in this. We need everybody to be pulling their share of the load and active in their group. All right, let's go on now. We're back to performance from chapter one. We left with this slide, okay? If you remember, performance has got three components. Instruction count, cycles per instruction, seconds per cycle. You can write it this way, you can write it this way with clock rate instead of clock cycle time, it doesn't matter. Let's analyze, let's look at the bullet points. Okay, these equations separate the three key factors, all of which whom is product is time, CPU time. Not total system time, not disk weight I.O. time, actual execution time on the CPU. You can measure the CPU execution time by running the program. You want to know how long the execution time is? Run the program. You can determine the clock rate because it's usually fixed and given. It's obvious. You can measure it if you have to get down there with an oscilloscope on it, but it's usually told to you. So you know the clock rate. You can measure this. You know that. You can measure the overall instruction count. That's this one here by running a profiling tool in the background as the program executes. Profilers and simulators uh, count how many times the branch instruction, how many times the jump instruction, how many times the add instruction, how many times the add immediate. They, they count every instruction and categorize it for you and give you statistics. So without knowing all the implementation details, you can measure this, you can measure this, and you know this, that allows you to calculate this. You can also um, analyze CPI because it varies by instruction type and it depends on the ISA implementation, but it can be sh uh, the, those data are also written when you know the details of the processor. So uh, you need to know implementation details, but if you get a hold of those, you can actually calculate CPI, and I'll show you how to do that. But even if you can't calculate it, you can deduce it by knowing three out of the four factors in the equation. All right, let's do an example here. Let's read this together. I'll, I won't read it out loud. I'll let you go through the paragraph. Okay. So this is a problem. We're going to solve it together.
Okay. So to summarize the problem, old program on old machine runs in 10 seconds with clock rate 4 gigahertz. We want to accelerate that to, and get it done in 6 seconds so you can calculate the performance improvement you're trying to get there. And when we do that, we know we're going to have to speed up the clock. The question is, how fast does the clock have to go? But one thing changes, unfortunately. It's not just a matter of speeding up the clock, because by running the, redesigning the architecture to allow a much faster clock rate, unfortunately, something happens to the CPI. Uh, and that is that the CPI on the accelerated machine um, is 1.2 times larger than the CPI on the original machine. Uh, unfortunately, um, you use this new expensive technology to increase the clock rate, but the, it affects the rest of the CPU design causing the machine to need more cycles. Each instruction on average takes more cycles, or some instructions take more and some take the same. But you basically, by shrinking the cycle time down so much, you cause some uh, instructions to become mul multi-cycle or larger cycle. So therefore, this fact is known, and that fact is always true. The number of CPU cycles is the number of instructions times the number of cycles per instruction. So instructions in the program times cycles per instruction gives you cycles in the program. So that's the total number of cycles is the number of instructions times the CPI. Okay, you're running the same program on machine A and me, machine B, so the number of instructions doesn't change. The compiler says, boot in there it is, you have to execute it. But this does change, and the uh, clock rates change. In the first case, the clock rate is 4 gigahertz. Notice that I'm using the denominator formula, so it's this times this divided by clock rate. Okay, so it's CPU uh, cycles, which is I times CPI divided by clock rate. So that's true, and in, in before we change anything, it's 10 seconds. And then after we change, we want it to be six seconds. It's going to be CPU clock cycles of B, which is what? I times CPI of B. Well, CPI of B is 1.2 times CPI of A. Right? So we, we've got all the numbers that we need. In the first one, we have everything except for I and CPI. And in the second one, we have everything except for I and CPI and the clock rate of B. But since I and CPI are common to the two of them, I think you can imagine we're going to be able to solve for them and, and get them out. Well, let's have a quick look at how you would do that math. And then after we're done, I want you to raise your hand if you think your middle school brother or sister could also do this math. Okay? I just want to remind everybody, this is not calculus, this is not differential equations. This is really basic single equation algebra. The first equation says that 10 seconds is equal to I times CPI of A times the clock cycle time or divided by the clock rate, which we have for gigahertz, okay? So anybody can manipulate that and help me find I times CPI of A, because that's what I'd really like to find, because I'm going to use that in B. Is that easy enough to find? Yeah, I think it's 40 times 10 to the 9th, okay? 40 times 10 to the 9th. This is cycles per second. This is seconds, so it ends up being cycles. And that's what we said. I times CPA is the total number of si CPI of A. So sure enough, right over here, total number of clock cycles to run the program on the original machine is 40 billion. 40 billion, okay? Now, the second equation says 6 seconds is equal to clock cycles of B for the program. Well, what's clock cycles of B for the program? Same number of instructions, I, times CPI of A. Whoa, 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 CPI of A is not the same as CPI of B. CPI of B is 1.2 times CPI of A, okay? So there we've got I times CPI of B divided by the new clock rate, which we don't know what it is, CR of B, okay? I'd like everybody to look at that equation and ask, do we have enough information to solve? Is this one equation with one unknown? No, it's one equation with three unknowns, but the good news is that pair of unknowns we just solved for is 40 times 10 to the ninth. So we'll substitute that right in here. 40 times 10 to the ninth times 1.2. Well, it happens to make it 48 times 10 to the ninth. 48 ten, times 10 to the ninth divided by something we don't know equals 6. You know what? That means 48 times 10 to the ninth divided by 6 equals the thing that we don't know, but we're just about to figure it out. Raise your hand if you think your middle school brother or sister could do this math. Raise your hand if you think your elementary school brother or sister could do this math. I'm not so sure about that, but surely middle school. Okay, great. <laughs> so there we go. 48 divided by 6 is equal to what? 8. So 8 times 
10 to the 9th cycles per second. Can anybody tell me how we call 8 times 10 to the 9th cycles per second? 8 gigahertz. 8 gigahertz. Okay. So what happened here? We doubled the clock frequency from 4 to 8, but we didn't get a doubling in performance, did we? What happened here? Instead of going from 10 to 5, it only went from 10 to 6. What caused that? That problem right there. We, the CPI got worse. If everything else had stayed the same, number of instructions same, CPI same, then of course whatever you do to the clock rate will be directly shown in the execution time, but it didn't stay the same. It didn't stay the same because the hardware had to change and be redesigned. You can't double the clock rate and expect all the hardware that worked at 4 gigahertz to just work just the same at 8 gigahertz. There's redesign in the machine organization, and the machine organization, unfortunately, had an unfortunate side effect. All right, let's go on a little bit more. Same idea, only this slide talks about real processors. Anybody here heard of mobile Intel Pentium 4? It's probably inside your laptop unless you bought a recent one with a Core Duo. Anybody here heard of Intel Pentium M? A low power version for uh, mobiles of all kinds. Notice the clock rate differences. What's the difference in clock rate? Don't say 0 0.8 gigahertz. Say a factor of 1.5. One of them is one and a half times as fast as the other. So should we get 1.5 times higher performance? Well, over here we doubled it and didn't get double the performance. I don't think we should expect that. Turns out, when you use mobile mark, which is a benchmark for mobile, uh, 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 mobile um, applications, such as Word on a laptop, Excel on a laptop, Photoshop on a laptop, power, the kind of things people do on laptops, businessmen, salespeople, students, whatever, guess what happens? Speed up the clock by 1.5, barely get any increase in performance at all. Why? 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 Because clock rate doesn't equal performance. You're fooling yourself if you think clock rate equals performance. It doesn't. This slide said it doesn't, improved it with numbers. This slide said it doesn't, improved it with real measurements. Do not think that if you pay $100 extra and get a 20% higher clock rate, that you're going to get 20% higher performance. You're not going to. Why? What did we learn about this from this? What's the answer to the why? Speeding up the clock rate with all other factors staying equal just doesn't exist. There's no such thing as all other factors staying equal. CPI didn't stay equal. Right, you had to redesign the hardware architecture to run the same instructions at a higher rate, and when we gained in clock rate, we lost some of it here. Actually, here we lost a lot of it. Here, 50% improvement in clock rate, 1.5 times faster, only 1.15 times faster overall performance. Hello, are you listening? Now you're no longer a little baby that says, Oh, sure, sir, I like to pay extra money to get a much faster clock rate because I know that's going to translate directly into much faster performance. Don't be so soft anymore, okay? <laughs> you know, don't give your money away so easily when you hear that. Now you've learned, haven't you? Now help others. You're going to be the hardware, computer, savvy engineer. Your company's got some money. They're going to spend it on improving the performance of their computer systems. You're going to have to help them spend it wisely and not waste it. There's a lot of salesmen that come along and say, I'd like to help you waste your money. Let me give you one or two interesting statistics that hopefully will completely fool you into spending your money the way I want you to. And you have to be the brake pedal that says, boss, don't listen to that. It's just propaganda. It's just a lot of business hype. I learned better in CS224. Listen, don't say yes. Let me talk to you after he leaves and I'll explain some things. And the boss is going to say, Wow, I'm really glad I hired you, Bill Kent computer engineer. You know what you're talking about. You know what you're talking about. Nobody ever taught me that in my MBA program or my economics or my marketing or my little Java plus MATLAB course that I took early on in my education. I'm glad I hired you with a sound, thorough education in hardware, software, and computer systems, and you can advise me. In fact, you know what? I'm seeing that you have not only a technical mind but also a good, sharp business mind. 
I've been thinking about promoting you up to group manager or engineering leader. You see, see what goes on when you get a Ganesh perspective, when you can communicate well, when you understand the wider perspective like you will understand in your summer stage this summer, get the business perspective. I'm trying to bring some of that in here. It helps you to become a leader. It helps you to become able to be a person that's, whose judgment is trusted, whose others follow, whose wisdom and advice they take and believe and depend on because it's believable and dependable. I'm going to be honest with you. Some of you will go out and be marketing and pre-sales and sales support people. That's fine. Honorable occupations, every one. But some of what sales people say is not believable or dependable. Am I telling the truth, Emre? <laughs> yeah. They, they tell you stuff that they think is going to motivate you to buy what they're selling. They're not interested in your ultimate good. They're interested in their own ultimate good, their company, their products, their profit, their bottom line. Don't expect them to think charitably about you and your situation and to protect your interests. That's not their job. You have to protect your interests, not the sales guy. They're nice. They're slick. But don't believe everything they say. Don't believe it. The psychology division and the business are full of courses in marketing. Most of those are about how to persuade decisions, okay? Persuade decisions. So what I'm trying to help you do is put a break and resist some of that stuff with truth. With truth, okay? Not with anti-propaganda. I don't believe in fighting propaganda or more propaganda. Fight it with truth. Fight it with facts. Fight it with reality. Reality has a great way of being the pin that goes pop to the balloon of hype and propaganda. Just take that reality pin and go and watch the salesman's face fade when you say, well, you know, that's very interesting, but I have some data that I got off of um, ZDNet and the statistics say otherwise and what you're claiming isn't actually in practice. Anyway, go on. Have, have fun with the sales guys, but know your facts. Know, all right. All right. Now, the next thing is CPI varies. Uh, different instruction types require different numbers of cycles. Some instructions can be done in one cycle. Some instructions take two. Some instructions take five, 10, even 20. Some of our floating point slower instructions are more than 20 cycles because they're, they're a state machine in themselves. OK, so when we report CPI for different types of instructions, I here is the type of instruction. So that type of instruction uh, multiplied by how many of them there are not that type, the CPI for that type, multiplied by how many of them are, summed up over all different types, give us the total clock cycles. Okay? Where CPI sub I is the CPI for a particular instruction type. And IC is the count for that number of instructions. So therefore, if you want to compute overall uh, CPI, this formula works. The top part is just what we looked at before. Add them all up, and then divide by the total instruction count. So now you don't have total cycles anymore. Now you have total cycles divided by total instructions, therefore average cycles per instruction. Or total cycles in the numerator is that, total cycles in the denominator is that, therefore giving you CPI. And so you can obtain this from the processor's data sheet and the instruction frequencies that you learn by code profiling. And what's code profiling? I said it before, I'm just going to say it again here. Code profiling is running a software program in the background mode that as a measurement tool counts the instructions by type while a program is running and says when the program's done, you had 28 million of this type, 22 million of this type, 11 million of this type, 2 million of this type, half a million of this type. You know, it tells you what you executed when it's all done. All right, so let's look at how to calculate average CPI. Notice that in this machine, or this instruction set architecture, there's four types, ALU instructions, that would be all kind of individual instructions, but the category's name is ALU. They work on the ALU. That would be the logical instructions, the arithmetic instructions, anything that's ALU. Those all execute in a single cycle. You know why? Because their source operands are in register, their destination's in register, there's nowhere else to go. So the ALU is designed in order in one clock cycle to be able to fetch two, do something with them, and put the answer back. So we can do those in one clock cycle. And it turns out those are 50% of all the instructions that we execute. We're doing something in the processor with data. Makes sense, about half the time you're doing that. Branch instructions are a little bit slower. They take two cycles because you've got to compare something and then change the value of the PC. And so those are about 20% of the time. 
And the load instructions, they also take two because they're going out to memory in order to get something and bring it in. And the store instructions take two because they're going out to memory to put something there. Anytime you go outside the processor, you're definitely not going to be able to do it in one cycle. Memory access is just slower than register access. This says access things in register. This says access things in memory. Makes sense. It's slower. That's why we like to have our operands in <coughs> register. In fact, in the RISC architectures, we force our operands to be in register. We say, put them there first, then I'll operate them. I don't do any business on memory operands. Cisco, Cisco processors say, oh, sure, give me a memory operand, give me a register operand, I'll work on them, I'll put it back in memory. What do you expect is going to be the clock cycle time for that? Very long. What if you say, oh, let's make it short? Well, then it's going to be multiple cycles, multiple little short ones in order to get the whole thing done. All right. Now, so since we have the CPI and we have the frequency, what does that mean? Number of instructions of this category divided by all instructions. That's this, the frequency. So the type multiplied by its frequency summed up overall. So here we go. 1 times 50% is 0 0.5. 2 times 20% is 0 0.4. 2 times 20% is 0 0.4. 2 times 10% is 0.2. If we add all these up, you know what we get? the average CPI for this instruction set. Yeah, it's the sum of this times this, you know, for each value of i. I got this kind, this kind, this kind, and this kind. So for the four, you add them up, and the average CPI for this machine is 1.5. 1.5 cycles per instruction. Can you see why? <clears throat> it's pretty easy, isn't it? Half the instructions take one, the other half take two, so therefore the overall average is the average of one and two, because it's equally weighted. 50% of them take two, 50% of them take one. It should be 1.5. Of course, there's more complicated examples where it won't be. OK, do we understand how that formula is applied? So this is just a living case study of that applied to a particular instruction set architecture. Where did we get these numbers? It said from the manufacturer's data sheet. Where did we get these numbers? profiling the code, running it and actually seeing with a background me software measurement tool what categories the a actual instructions executed fell in. Okay? Can do that. You can do that. Engineers run experiments, collect data, analyze data. That's a doable thing. Okay? All right, now let's now that we got that, we understand how the formula works, you see the thing in action. See that plus plus plus? That's the same as that dude right there for the four categories from I equals one, which is ALU, I equals two, which is branch, I equals three, which is the load, I equals four, which is the store. The four categories, we multiply this times the frequency and sum them all up. Bingo. Are we ready to go on? Everybody okay? Any questions about that? I want to make sure you understand that. Can you do that yourself? Okay, good. Now let's go to here. What fraction of the time is spent in data transfers. What do we mean data transfers? <laughs> Memory to register? Is that a data transfer? Register to memory? Is that a data transfer? Yeah, so it means loads and stores. What fraction of the time is spent in loads and stores? What fraction of the time is spent in loads and stores? I don't see time anywhere there. But there's a way to get an answer to that very easily, isn't it? Of my average CPI, what percentage of it is spent in loads and stores? 0 0.6 divided by 1.5 is 40%. We spend 40% of our time doing loads and stores. What percent of our time do we spend doing arithmetic and logic? Do we spend half our time? Do we spend half our time doing arithmetic and logic? No, we spend half the instructions doing arithmetic and logic. What percent of the time? Since they're fast, we only spend 0.5 divided by 1.5. We only spend <coughs> one third or 33 percent of our time doing loads and stores. What percent of our time do we spend doing branches and jumps? Where jumps, jumps will be included in this, it's very small, but what percentage of our time do we spend doing branches and jumps? 0.4 divided by 1.5. We spend 27% of our time doing branches and jumps. Okay? So look here. If you want to make this machine go faster, would it be worth it to spend your engineering effort and time to speed up branching? 
or to speed up ALUing, or to speed up data transferring. Why would I want to put my engineering time and effort on this, and not on this, and not on this? What principle would guide our decision there? Let's say I have a team of three engineers and the manager says, look, we've got enough budget for those people to spend six months speeding up this process, or I want a lower CPI. Should I spend my three engineers six months on this, or on this, or on that? Make the uncommon case fast? Make the middle common case fast? No, make the common case fast. Yeah, I'll get my biggest bang for the buck if I focus here. Ah, okay. Right. When considering where to try and improve performance, invest your resources where the time is spent. Because what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to speed up execution time, right? So therefore, since we found out what percent of the time, and percent of the time, so therefore speeding up this will speed up execution time more than speeding up this. Let me put it a different way. If I was able to cut this time in half, or this time in half, or this time in half with the same amount of engineering effort and budget, what would speed up the processor the most? Cutting this in half, because I'd gain 20%. I'd have a 1.2 performance improvement. What would happen here? 1.135. What would happen here? 1.165 or 66 or whatever. I mean, you, this is 20%. This is 16%. Half of this is only 13.5%. Do you see how it works? You're looking at hard numbers making intelligent engineering decisions. Okay? So if somebody from another university, graduate from another department comes along and says, hey, I got a great idea. We need a team we can speed up branching. Tell him to shut up and sit down or read the, the book, Peterson and Hennessy. What book did you study? Make the slowest case fast? That's your idea about good engineering? Come on. Tell the boss. Okay. All right, now let's look at this example. Here's another. No, I'm serious. I'm trying to bring the real world in here. You, you know, there's a lot of theory in university, but if you don't know how to apply it in practice, you're practically useless. They'll say, we're paying you all this money, and all you can do is solve back of chapter problems. We have real world problems here. Can you not help us? We're going to give you three more months. If you still can't help us, then your probation period is over, and you'll have to find another job, because we're going to have to find somebody who can help us. The last thing we would ever want from our department is for Bill Kent graduates to be sort of high Ali, Gerchek, Dunyanan, Kopmush, great at back of chapter problems, but no use on real world problems. That's the last thing we would ever want. Okay? So we're trying to get you to taste the real world with course applications and stage practice and teams on projects and things like that. Taste the real world. Yeah, you're, we're not paying you money. You're paying us money. But very soon, they'll be paying you money. And then the accountability will be so much higher. You know, it doesn't really kill you if you get a C or a D. Even an F you can recover from. But getting fired from your job, that's a really bad situation. That's very hard to recover from. If you're a useless employee and you show that for a long enough period of time, it's going to really hurt if you're let go. Because what are you going to say to the next job? The last, how was your last job? How'd you do? Uh, Sorma. <laughs> you know, go back to my freshman year. I took a job, of course. That teacher thought I was good. Uh, well, what about the last two, three things you did? How are those? Uh, Sorma. You know, that's not going to go over too well. All right, let's have a look. Here's another example. ALU is 50%, loads 20, stores 10, branches 10. But this time, we've got a different number of cycles. We can do our ALUs in one cycle. We can do our loads in five, stores in three, branches in two. So we change the, the mix. This is a different uh, processor, has a different organization, therefore a different number of cycles per instruction for each category. Same four categories. We'll include the jumps in here with the branch for now. Okay? And so now what we've got is number of cycles. And we've got frequency, so what are we doing, remember? This times this, 0.5. This times this, 1.0. This times this, 0.3. This times this, 0.4. My CPI average is now 2.2. Can you tell me why it's 2.2? Why is it 2.2? Because I got some that are faster than 2.2 and some that are slower than 2.2, and their weighted average comes out to be 2.2. I can see why it's 2.2. This one wants to make it lower. This one wants to make it higher. You know, I've got a number of different, uh, none of them are exactly 2.2. They can't be, because it's going to be an integer number of cycles. But the weighted average will be 2.2. You know about weighted averages? Yeah, you, you, I don't know the Turkish name for it, but there must be some, you know, you must have already seen weighted averages. You know, if I, if I want to take the average weight in this room, and I say the boy's average weight is 70 kilos, and the girl's average weight is 55 kilos, should I just add 70 and 55 and divide by 2? Why is that a bad idea? 
because there are a whole lot more boys and a whole lot less girls in this room, right? So the 55 kilo weighted at, the, 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 the weighting should be small. It looks like it's about 15%. And the 70 kilo weighting should be quite heavy. So it's not going to be divided by two. That would be cifrin octobase times the boy's weight plus cifrin octobase times the girl's weight. They're not equal numbers, therefore I shouldn't weight it equally. This is, this is correct. Okay, so now, <coughs> out of this 2.2 cycles, how much percent of the time is spent in ALU? 0.5 over 2.2, 23% of the time. How much time is spent in loading? 1.0 over 2.2. Whoa, almost half our time is spent doing loads. 0.3 over 2.2, very little of our time is spent doing stores. 0.4 over 2.2, 18% of our time is spent doing uh, branches. Okay, given that, my first question to you is do you understand? what we're talking about here. Percent of time, where'd that come from? This divide that, this divide that, this divide that. This. That's how these numbers came from. How did this come from? Some of those. How did this come from? That times that, that times that, right? Do you understand what's going on here? Okay, now, here come the red questions. These are good questions. These are engineering questions. That other stuff is just little middle school math. Everybody can do that. Now, you, now the engineering comes. How much faster would the machine be if we had a better data cache and we missed less and hit more and didn't have to go to slow main memory and we reduced the average load time to two cycles because we hit in cache better and didn't have to go whoa, slow to main memory. In other words, we speeded up our memory accessing for our loads and so instead of five, we're able to go two here. Now, don't misunderstand me. A better data cache is going to take a fair amount of engineering manpower. It's going to take some good, clever design for cache organization. And we'll see that when we get there in the, in the book. It's going to definitely take some space on the processor. So it's not free. Not free by any means. But if we get that good cache, what do we gain? Well, we gain, obviously, a change from five to two here. And the question is, how much faster will the machine be? In other words, old machine speed versus new machine speed. Old machine performance versus new machine performance. Well, we don't have speed here. We don't have performance here. We don't have time here. A lot of things we don't have here. We only have one thing here. What is here? CPI. Does it matter that we don't know the number of instructions? Does it matter that we don't know the clock cycle time? No, because they're going to be the same before this and after this. So I stay same. Clock cycle time stays same. Only thing that's going to change is CPI. We're going to have old CPI of 2.2 and new CPI of? Uh, let's think about it here. If this goes to 2, then 20% times 2 equals 0.4. So instead of 1.0, it's 0.4. So instead of 2.2, it goes to what? 1.6. Great. Old CPI, new CPI, everything stayed the same. Who can tell me? How much faster the machine is? How much faster is the machine? 11 divided by 8? I'm not sure I believe that. Where'd you get the 11 and where'd you get the 8? I see 1.6 and 2.2. Right, remember what we're asking here. Old time divided by new time. That's going to be big divided by little, so that's going to give me a speed up greater than one. Or new performance divided by old performance, that should give me a number greater than one. So what's proportional to the old time here? Old CPI. So that's proportional to old time. What's proportional to my new time? New CPI. Now, that's not time. How do I turn that into a time? Number of instructions multiplied by clock cycle time. Demi, that's time. How do I turn that into a time? Number of instructions multiplied by clock cycle time. So let's, let's do it. Let's, let's do the real McCoy here. Old time equals I times 2.2 times clock cycle time. New time equals I times 1.6 times clock cycle time. Now, can you see why I didn't want to really mess with them? Bye-bye, bye-bye, we're back to this, okay? It's 2.2 over 1.6, and that's old time over new time, which is going to give me what? Give me what? About 1.35 or 1.38 performance increase. In other words, 
faster by that factor. Okay? If you've got a calculator or computer, you can punch it out right now. Big gain, big gain in performance by speeding up the cache and having a much higher cache hit rate and moving this down. Okay, so my question to you is, would you like to go 35% faster? I would, but it depends. Do I need 10 engineers for 10 years, or can I do it with two engineers in six months? There's still a cost. You know, to do this is going to have a cost. The question is, is the cost worth the benefit? Okay, so let's make an estimate about what that will be as an engineering project manager. You think about the manpower and the time, and you think about the cost of that. You think about what increase in sales that would give, and you decide it's worth it or it's not worth it. But somebody comes along while you're doing that and says, I got a different idea. Never mind that cash and those loads. I got a great idea. We could use branch prediction, which is going to require some design time. Please don't misunderstand. and some space on the on processor. But if we use branch prediction, we will speed up the branch time. We'll shave off a whole cycle. We can do our branching in one instead of two with this cool hardware algorithm that predicts where the branch will go. Great. How much performance will that give me? Well, I will go from two to one because we shaved a cycle off. We shaved a cycle off. Got it? Two. We shaved off one. Now it's down to one. So this is one times 0.2. So this becomes 0.2. So instead of 2.2, it's 2.0. What's the speed up? What's the speed up? 2.2 over 2.0 equals 1.1. Okay, that's only a 10% improvement or a factor of 1.1 in greater in performance. So the question is, well, that's an interesting idea. How many engineers and how long and how much transistor space do you think it'll take to do that? Well, I don't really know. Well, then your answer is, well, then we're not doing it until we have a reasonable estimate because I've already got one that'll give me a 35% improvement, and I know its cost because we did an engineering study. This 10% improvement that you're proposing, let's see if it's going to come in at a reasonable cost. Because it wouldn't make any sense, would it, to invest the same amount of manpower and transistor space with branch prediction as it would to invest that same manpower, design time, and transistor space in better cache because one's going to give a 1.1 improvement and one's going to give a 1.35 improvement. Do you see that? See, we're, we're, we're comparing directly using numbers. All right, let's go another one. What if we could do two ALU instructions at once. That's certainly possible if I had double data path. My control unit fetches two and sends them both into the uh, pipeline at the same time, different pipelines, and they both decode and fetch their operands and execute at the same time, and in one clock cycle, bang, I get two results. See, this says you get one result in one clock cycle. This says, give me two at once. So if I get two results in one clock cycle, what's the number of cycles per one instruction? Half, yeah, 0 0.5 for one, and therefore two in 1.0, and three in 1.5, and two and four in 2.0, yeah. So the CPI of one goes to 0 0.5. Well, if we make this 0 0.5 by doing this, then we get 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, which is 0.25. So if that's 0 0.25 instead of 0 0.5, we change the sum to what? 1.95. So now this third improvement says, okay, the old was 2.2, the new is 1.95. What's my speed up on that? And it's something in between these two, as you can see. Not much different than this, actually. So let's just call it 1.15 or 1.18. Okay, better than this, but not nearly as good as that. And the question is, how much time is it going to take to implement this double pipeline? and to change the control to launch two instructions at once and to have two ALUs so that I can be shifting here and adding here or subtracting here and oring here. I need two ALUs. Definitely I know the transistor space. How long will it take your design team of engineers to get this into our uh, data path? Three months, sir. Okay, and we can count the cost and maybe we'll decide that a 15% improvement is worth it. Depends on how the 35% improvement, how, how much the cost of that is. But clearly you can see, this is the one that has the potential for the greatest improvement. This one is far less, and this one is the worst of all. So you can say, does it make sense to speed up loads? Does it make sense to speed up ALU? Does it make sense to speed up branching? And look what happened here. Big return here, because we're trying to make the common case fast. Modest return here, much less, 
because we're trying to make a middle case fast. And for branching, we're trying to make almost the slowest case faster. So, of course, the smallest return. Remember, one more time. Working on this gave a 10% improvement. Working on this gave a 15% improvement. Working on this gave a 35% improvement. Huh. Makes sense, doesn't it? Make the common case fast. If you were going to look at this and say, your processor is too slow, where do you want to spend your engineering effort and time? The likely candidate, the obvious candidate, is in the loads. Obvious candidates in the loads. Especially if working on loads happen to improve stores also. Okay? If it happened to improve stores also, that would really be great. We could speed up caching. Okay? Any questions on that stuff? All right. I might have tired you out. I don't know. But this level of engineering analysis is what the occupation is all about. If you like this stuff, you're going to be a great engineer. If you can't stand this stuff, I'm wondering if American studies or drama or music might be a little bit more to your... This is what it's all about. This is what we do as our occupation. We analyze, think through, come up with quantitative assessments, and then make good judgment calls about what the best use of time and money and transistor space is. Okay. Now, there's some factors here that I, didn't, that I didn't really... you don't know about. One is project management. Who knows if it takes three engineers three months or six engineers six months? Well, that comes from knowing the process of engineering management. I suggest to you guys that you take that course in the third year and you look for management options in your social science and think about that. A lot of you are going to end up being engineering managers. So it isn't just about what the technical benefit is. It's also about the cost in getting it to market. But then the question is still, okay, so we did it. Who's going to buy it? And can we charge $50 more? Will they still buy it? Or will they only buy it for three cents more? If they're only going to buy it for three cents more, you better not spend too much on your engineering changes because you're going to take a long time to get it back if your three cents is the only difference. You understand? So some financial and management issues here, of course, that we're not teaching in this course. They're part of the overall equation. But you can't go anywhere until you have the technical analysis under your belt, until you can do this kind of thing and talk real numbers, not sales hype. Real numbers, not sales hype. Okay? All right. I think that's a good place to take a break. So why don't we take 10? Come back, we'll do some more problems after break.